Hi everyone. Welcome to Pen Connect. Can you guys hear me? All right. Okay. I can. Hi everyone. Welcome to I Pen can. Connect Women Authors. Pen Connect is Penmency's unique venture where we are celebrating women authors in the Indian literary space. And we already have our esteemed guests with, with us over here. And before we go ahead and introduce them, I'm going to introduce our host for the evening, Chandra Sandeep. Chandra is a multi-award winning writer. She has a penchant for writing stories and opinion pieces that revolve around social issues. Her desire is to use her words to change perceptions and create awareness in the society. She has contributed to about 20 Indian and international anthologies. And apart from writing stories, she's also engaged in content writing and book reviewing. Now, without any further delay, I'm going to hand over the reins of this session to Chandra. Chandra, over to you. We are looking forward to a wonderful engagement. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm really excited to have our uh, guests here. So I can see a few people have joined in. So, all right then. So this is our third episode of the third edition of Pen Connect with Women Authors. This month, we are celebrating women authors and their achievements in the Indian literary space. Our gifting partner for Pen Connect is Earth Basket. Today we have with us Mona Verma and Sai Swarupa Iyer. We will be discussing women in mythological stories. Reliability versus relatability. Welcome, Mona and Sai. We are very excited to have you both as panelists on our platform. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Let me take a, a quick Thank moment you. and uh, introduce our guests. Um, I mean, they don't need an introduction, but even then, let me just share a few lines about them. Mona Verma is an award-winning author of eight books and over a dozen anthologies. She has edited various science journals, self-help books, and biographies, and also specializes as a haiku, limericks, and tanka poet. Her books have been su the subject of the thesis for many research scholars and ICAC ELT series. Recently, she has been listed in the 50 Iconic Authors 2022 category by Aesthetics International. She has served as a member of the Asia Development Bank for the Uttarakhand chapter. She's a Paul Harris Fellow and has been selected as the jury by Insolvency Law Academy for their literary endeavors and competitions on bankruptcy and insolvency. Sai Swarupa Iyer is the author of five mythological books, Abhaya, Abishi, Draupadi, Rukmani, and Maori. She has an MBA from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and is a former investment professional. She is currently an assistant professor at Chanakya University. She received the prestigious Stri Shakti Award in 2022. Her second novel, Avishi, Vishpala of Rig Veda Reimagined, has been optioned by a major production house in India. And that is going to be India's answer to the Wonder Woman and will hit the screen soon. Wow, that sounds exciting. I'm looking forward to the India's answer to the war. Congratulations. Wonder Woman. Congratulations. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so I can see many people have joined in. So let's kickstart our session. Uh, let me just take a moment to remind the audience that there are six books to be won at the end of the session. And I really hope all of you are ready with your questions for Mona and Sai. All right, so let's begin our discussion. Uh, my first question is to both of you, and uh, whoever wants to go first can go. Do you have a favorite female character from Hindu mythology? If yes, who and why? If not, then again, why? Uh, Mona, would you like to go first? Oh, OK, OK. I was uh, waiting for Sai Ma'am to begin. <laughs> Because she's senior to me, so I just thought oh, so. Oh, Mammy, oh, you'd oh. like to begin? That's okay. Oh, no, you can go first, Mona. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, my uh, favorite character 
Well, that's a that's a tricky question, but it was you know when I was exploring and I was doing research for uh, my book Banaras and also for the Deva Sutras and now recently for the folk tales from around the world, it is actually in Indian context such as Parvati. Okay. Not only because you know the originator of the Shakti Peets or whatever, but as a woman, as as the tryst between the goddess and the mother. For example, you know everybody knows about how Vinayaka was beheaded and the elephant head was put, and then came Ganesha. So the boy Vinayaka turned into Ganesha. So when right. I was exploring as to what could have gone in the mind of a mother, I came across so many versions, and I was I was totally totally enamored by the character of Parvati. And then as any retell goes. there is a lot that goes in from the in the mind of the author as well the author writes from their own perspective so it becomes like three dimensional what you read what you know from the text what you feel it is and how you would like to present that uh, entire juxtaposition to the world outside so i felt that when when parvati tells shiva how can you expect me as a mother not as a goddess but as a mother to take in this boy who was not my son 5 minutes earlier that elephant boy as my son how do you expect a mother to accept something like that so i gave her that dimension when i wrote the when i wrote the story parvati's son i didn't call mm-hmm. him vinayaka i didn't call him ganesha but it is parvati's son and how parvati um seeks this boon from um from shiva that there needs to be a temple where ganesh my son vinayaka has to be worshiped and not ganesha so there is a temple in tamil nadu where mm-hmm. ganesha is not the elephant boy he is the vinayaka the only temple so i think that was something very strong it came for for her to challenge her husband not just to challenge her husband she challenged shiva because that destruction came from shiva and she came across and she won the war as a mother not as a goddess yes. so to me she was very strong excellent so what about you sai do you have any yes. favorites so firstly a very wonderful uh, you know encapsulation of uh, the whole you know beautiful story of uh, ganesha and uh, uh, you know goddess parvati monaji because even i am a practicing uh, shakta if i can say so so if you ask me uh, you know what's your favorite uh, woman and uh, you know if divine uh, uh, you know the goddesses are uh, allowed uh, i would choose one aspect of uh, goddess parvati uh, mm-hmm. she is i couldn't i haven't written about her maybe you know i need some more blessings to happen yeah. so <laughs> so she is uh, goddess lalita parmeshwari so who uh, you know who was born out of uh, you know the yagna so what happens is uh, again if i have uh, time for a small story what happens yes. is when uh, parvati herself was doing her tapasya to uh, you know win over shiva right and uh, kamadeva is burnt down by lord shiva and mm-hmm. out of the ashes of kamadeva there was a asura born called bhandasura and he started uh, you know he also did tapasya and uh, you know brahma gave him all kinds of uh, you know boons of all kinds of invincibility and also a very invincible city you know it, and uh, he starts being a greater terror than you know already tarakasura was already was and uh, so the devatas they are already you know they are terrorized by uh, tarakasura and they have no way out now and uh, they go to lord shiva and he agrees to uh, say the bhandasura is born out of that negativity right of uh, you know manmatha was uh burnt to ashes so where all interest in life everything you know where whereas manmatha represented a certain positivity of you know a yearning and uh, you know desire ambition as the, the positive aspects of that so bhandasura actually is dragging the universe back because uh, you know he represents everything that is the negative side of it so he stands for that uh, complacency or the inertia lethargy everything so 
uh, you know, philosophically, symbolically that. So to actually, you know, get over Bhandasura, we actually need to uh, awaken the divine feminine. And he does a homer uh -huh. where he, he is the, uh, you know, chief priest. And the gods, they actually jump into the fire. So basically, Lalita Parameshwari is born out of that, uh, you know, the teja of every, all the gods. And she goes to fight uh, Bhandasura. So I know that's a, it's a very long story and a very fascinating story of how the feminine uh, represents everything that is positive, everything that nurtures, everything that sustains against something that wants everything to stop. That's right? so quite an feminine. interesting and fascinating uh -huh. tale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So that's, uh, you know, she's my goddess. She's the goddess I worship every day. So, uh, you know, she has to be my favorite. And hopefully you should be writing about Parvati too soon. <laughs> <laughs> With her blessings. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, since you were talking about, we are discussing about the power of these women goddesses that we worship in mythology. But then do you feel there is also sometimes that these women were women were also victims of patriarchy and misogyny? Or is that something which is only we see in contemporary times? Uh, if I can, uh, you know, answer go first, uh, when you talk about patriarchy and misogyny, the first example that uh, stood against those two uh, evils, I can say is Rukmini. Uh, because yeah. I I think the shastras or whatever the code of uh, conduct that was written, uh, mm -hmm. if if interpreted properly, that uh, tended to be balanced. It was not to be my you know misogynist or even though it followed a certain patrilineal structure, it was not to uh, you know they had a way of distributing power responsibility everything between both the genders but mm -hmm. but there are always we are humans so there are always few you know forces that want to imbalance that want that are greedy or weak or you know uh, you know they they tend to tip things out of balance that is why uh, i think one of those consequences was you know rukmini's forced marriage with shishupal now you know can a daughter go against her parents and have her choice very much yes because the shastra itself says never uh, go against the kanya's choice always mm -hmm. you have to uh, you know abide by her choice and actually her uh, father her brother especially was going against the code of conduct to be but she had the knowledge as well as uh, better decision making as well as uh, the vision to put it to action right it's not just uh, you know helpless uh, woman pining for you know un unrequited love or yeah. something like that so i think uh, these heroines were way ahead <laughs> of their times so they they knew how to put things back into balance so True. there is balance there is you know imbalance happening due to certain you know forces and these were those wonderful women who knew how to put things back in place Perfectly captured. Muna, what are your views on that? Uh, well, you know, as Sai Ma'am just said, I, and I completely agree with her that, you know, um, the male proponents of law and religion always ensured that women were just feminine. There's nothing wrong with being feminine, but you have to be feminine with your strength in place. Femininity is not something which is taken to be some somebody who's weak, somebody who's docile, somebody who's forever <laughs> forbidden. Femininity with strength is character. And that is what all these women, I would, I'm very proud of our Indian heritage. All this entire repository of fables, legends, stories that we have, hundred women as very strong characters. But yes, of course, there have been male proponents of law and religion, as I just said. There's a story in Padam Purana, which is a story of Narottam. And Narottam mm -hmm. is a Brahmin. So mm -hmm. when his powers are taken away by Vishnu, because he killed a, an innocent bird, and he sees that the same powers are with a Chandala, 
hmm. and with a housewife and with a sahukar a merchant he is wondering how come these people a person who deals with money or person that he takes to be very corrupt or just a woman as he says it or just a chandala as he says it how can they have it so you know over there that kind of um uh, that patriarchy is very much visible so when you look at the social setup and you say as a chandala you understand that why he is saying so you don't agree with it but you understand but the moment he says how come a woman has it <laughs> yeah that's the male ego in so question of course, there of course it has been but then we as writers are hefting a very huge responsibility on our shoulders so when we are into rewriting or we are retelling the stories we have to be very responsible and aware of the fact that kind of stories we are culling out and telling the world outside should have the right message should go across because in case i want my devi sutras to be read by young people as well i need to bust the stereotypes yes i need to be asking questions so the kind of stories that i'm retelling the story should have be backed by logic the story should be backed by reasoning the story should also celebrate gender fluidity the story should should um should represent the women's rights even if it is not there in the original story in case uh, sorry in in case it is not there in the original story i leave it aside because if i do not agree with it how can i accept how can i expect a reader to agree with it true so we have to be we have to make that very sensible decision of course there are stories that go either ways yeah i think and that's where as writers our responsibility comes in yes we really have the power to you know convey the right kind of message that we want our future readers to be reading right right of course uh sai uh, you know i was just uh, looking at the books that you have written five of them all five around female heroines so is there a conscious effort on your part to tie together feminism and mythology Uh, so i think i mean it didn't happen very consciously i may say till book 3 or so okay uh, so when i started uh, uh, writing abhaya it was uh, more or less uh, it's my uh, love for krishna uh-huh. uh, you know i know i am a devi worshipper but i have a different uh, kind of relationship with uh, lord krishna i used to really fancy uh, anything about him since childhood so that uh, you know just grew with me and uh, in my high school uh, college uh, early college i had this very interesting conversation with a muslim friend of mine uh, you know grassroots open conversations take place it's not like how things get things are waiting to get ugly on social media but uh, uh, so she very innocently asked me uh, without no malice i can guarantee that ki Uh, no why do you guys love krishna so much he has like so many wives and uh, <laughs> and uh, you know if you consider him just yeah he's a god so we have to worship him kind of a thing i can still understand but you guys really love him uh, so i uh, told her the story of narakasura as to you know why the reason why he has so many wives is because uh, you know he wanted these women who were captured by narakasura uh, to lead a you know dignified life and uh, unfortunately their families were not accepting him them back mm. and he had to set an example there uh, so and this is one reason why we even love him more right though it is not uh, conscious but you know these are the acts that you know the god the gods come to restore balance there is already imbalance happening gods come to True. restore that balance so uh then that conversation stayed with me and uh, somehow uh, the imaginative side of me started imagining this reimagining this whole story from the perspective of one of those uh you know 16000 women and uh-huh. uh, yeah and the journey just grew because uh, you know in creating a character there's something about reading and uh, narrating it but uh something about reimagining like it is happening again or uh, uh you know there's the whole uh, so that character will have an origin they she yes. has some likes dislikes aims objectives things that she doesn't like and in the, and then i had to set it in the backdrop of mahabharata so i had to reconcile uh, this uh, narakasura vadha with the mahabharata as to you know what would be happening in the 
uh, main plot of Mahabharata. You know, perhaps it's the Rajasuya thing going on. So everybody were busy, and uh, this guy found uh, all the time to slink away girls from <laughs> everyone. Then uh, you know, I stumbled upon the uh, the Shakta lores actually. So it's uh, the Kamarupa. Uh, Stella Puranas, they say that uh, Narakasura, uh, Bhauma, actually his name was, uh, he is a Shakti worshipper. Okay. Who, uh, uh, yeah, who uh, desired the goddess herself. And uh, the goddess tested him and uh, she found a way to kill him. So Shaktas believe that it was uh, Kamakya Devi who killed uh, mm -hmm. Narakasura. Then the Vaishnavas believe it's Vishnu or Krishna. And there is a legend in the south which believes that uh, Bhauma was the son of Bhumi, so he wanted to die only in the hands of his mother. And, uh, you know, kind of trusting that uh, nobody will, uh, no, a mother will not kill her own son. That was his, uh, uh, you know, that was his assumption. And Satya Bhauma was uh, avatar of Bhumi. He's considered, he's, she's believed to be avatar of Bhumi. So, you know, when Krishna faints, Satya Bhauma steps up and kills uh, Narakasura. So that is, uh, so these are uh, three uh, varied legends about uh, Narakasura, but I found it a great opportunity to relook at the socio-political conditions of the Mahabharata. So as, mm -hmm. I said, as I said, there is a universe and the forces of universe that keep in balance. They are not patriarchal or even feminist. They look for balance. But then there are forces which try out of greed, out of power hunger, out of whatever that, you know, try to, you know, put on, put in these uh, social structures or misuse social structures for their own uh, greed or you know what oh, all these happens and then God yeah, comes the to the law of that nature balance. the fight yes. between balance and imbalance <laughs> imbalance uh, thank you so much uh, Sai. Uh, that was quite insightful I think I'm sure many of our readers would not be interested in reading Abhya too it sounds very interesting uh, Muna I have yes. a question for you from uh, Kushbu here um, mm -hmm. She says that, Mona, ma'am, I loved your book. One thing that struck me was how you brought logic to the tales. Even elements of nature like Vindhya Mountain or the Ashoka tree came to life, but in a relatable manner. And you did it without you drawing exaggerated parallels with current times, unlike oh, a lot yeah. of mythofiction today. Was that a conscious effort? Uh, which book is this, Mona ji? Uh, this the, is the Deva Sutras. It Deve is 24 Sutras. stories from the 18 Mahapuranas. Ah, okay. Lovely, lovely. I'll check so, it out. <laughs> yes, thank beautiful you. books. Sir. You should definitely check it out. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Kushbu, for that wonderful question. Well, of course, it was very deliberate. Kushbu, as I said, that, you know, this book was written with my daughter. And so Sanjana Varma. So it was during the COVID times that, you know, I had to keep both the girl and the boy from tearing each other's hair out. And I thought that, you know, all the energies of the Rahu and Ketu need to be put into, into needs to be channelized. So I told my, I told, I told my son, you make the mood board for the cover. And I told my daughter that let's go through the stories from the Mahapuranas and call out to the ones which have logic which have which have a physical evidence in place so kushbu going by your question yes it was deliberate and of course sai ma'am and chandra will agree with me because they've done so much of work in that field that they're far ahead of me in the course uh, there that um, it, it is a whole lot of hard work now you're doing a whole lot of research but in case you are writing what you find in the uh, Ashtadash Purana or the Kanchi Kalkoti Pitam, if you're writing, rewriting the same thing, why will somebody spend 300, 400 bucks to buy your book? They won't. You have to retell those stories in such an interesting way that you need to get the younger people interested. Now, how do sure. I get younger people interested? First of all, you can't you can't cite anything which is preposterous. That something like this happened. Give a reason for why something like this happened. Why Chandradev was forced to marry all the twenty seven oh, sisters? Why? Why? And how they are those constellations in the sky that we see today? And also one thing that I was very particular about, which was also like, you know, something which threaded all these 24 stories together was that I gave a physical evidence for all those stories. So why is there a shuktal? 
why is there is a somnath temple why is there a ram setu so when you see the physical evidences of all these stories what the conclusions of all these stories out there you tend to connect better with those stories so that is something i was careful about you know telling people about those 27 constellations telling people about the somnath temple telling how shukadev uh you know told the um bhagavat purana to king parikshit and that is why you have the shuktal near saharanpur so when you give these physical evidences you are drawing in the readers into a world where they start believing in those stories which were apparently the shrutis and the smritis so how do you retell so that was the reason and that is why at the end of every story i give a conclusion i give a reason for telling you that story so of and uh, one thing that i was particular about was that despite of all a whole lot of research i did not want to sound researched i yeah. wanted to tell it as a story because young people will not take in anything which is didactic absolutely so, absolutely i hope that answers your question uh kushboo i hope it does kushboo um uh, ma'am as i was telling you i recently read your book and i loved it so much and you know i haven't stopped recommending it enough this is i think one book that we all should read it's written in a simple manner it covers whole lot of topics and it's very easy to understand and relate with thank you the thank you mother daughter duo has done a tremendous job there but you know when i was reading the book there are certain chapters which are fairly well known and some which are not that popular amongst many of us so hmm. how did you decide to which uh, you know chapters to include from the puranas or not see one thing is there chandra that the story had to be interesting after all you know the book goes to a publisher and the publisher needs to laugh his way to the bank he needs to keep the publisher thinking <laughs> isn't it so if the story is not interesting no matter how well researched it is or it comes across as didactic he will say okay mona give me something else but you know mm -hmm. luckily i submitted these 24 stories and not a single story was sidelined by either the publisher or the editor they took in all oh. 24 of them so i was careful about making them um, making them interesting because one thing is there see uh, generally people come and tell us that young people these days do not read i don't agree you know i mean if you go uh, i was apparently i think i was in england during that time and at we were coming back from somebody's place after dinner it was well late into the night i think almost like 1:30 am or so and mm -hmm. i asked my brother i saw these huge circum serpentine queues right mm -hmm. as what's happened us tan mein to tabhi hota jab muft prasad milta hai then you see these <laughs> So I said, "What is this? Where, where, where are these cues ending?" So he said, "Go on. You just see. You know, tomorrow the new Harry Potter book is releasing. So these cues oh. lead to W. N. Smith or Waterstones." It made wow. me realize. You know, it just stinked within me. People love to read, but to get somebody interested, you have to write in an interesting way. Excellently said. That is, I think, there's no better way. <laughs> the harry potter movie sai ma'am would know most of these things are also there in apuranas the trees talking to you the trees dropping yes. children ashok sundari look at that look at shikhandi hmm. right but they love snape but not shikhandi why because maybe we have at some point maybe we have been unsuccessful in making those stories more interesting keep away some retell in a more interesting way people will will um, uh, read the books you know when it comes to the puranas or the vedas or stories from the scriptures <clears throat> i'm sure sai ma'am will agree with me if we start telling those stories to a 10 year old it's like forcibly feeding a child who's not hungry <laughs> but even if a child is not hungry and you show them a pizza suddenly they are hungry so i had to turn my stories into that pizza that's a nice and approach you that you have implemented there so i uh, you know without of course we could not dilute the mainstay mm -hmm. we have to we have to be very very careful because most of these characters also have a religious standing so there is yes. a no go area you cannot offend people's sensibilities 
you cannot do that people believe in them people repose their faith and trust in those deities they worship them so there was a no go area but i went by you know citing um, the different verticals the different thought processes of those deities and as they say when you when we are writing there are four pillars to writing there's a dialogue there's emotion there's an object there's a character and their conflict so if one of these one of these verticals is used extensively to make your text more appealing than what's the harm so i used lots of emotion there because i had to make them relatable i think yes so uh, ranjini's next question uh, would uh, is on similar lines wherein she's asking how do you make them relevant to this generation <laughs> so uh relevant i mean uh, mona ji has uh, actually answered this in a very beautiful yes. way uh, uh so scientific research i think india uh, indian uh, uh, whole indian mm -hmm. tradition has been more experiential than analytical in the olden days so sadly i mean there is a there is a certain balance between experientialism and you know the analysis thing if one outgrows the other again there is a problem of this balance right so once uh, you know if i experience something i don't have to prove it to others uh, firstly i shouldn't seek it to seek to prove it to others and i don't have to prove it to others because i within me i know that it is true so the and a lot of our texts are based on this experiential tradition Hmm. so when we put on our analytical very 100% analytical lenses we already have a very limited view science has a limited view of the universe we have a limited knowledge of science i am not undermining anybody uh, here but you know that's a vast subject right yeah. every even you know uh, and every scientist also has his own uh, area of specialization so with this uh, layered limited uh, nature i think what we should do is uh, not limit i mean it's a it's a good way to look at uh, everything analytically but maybe not put a uh, put that analytical end to the stories of the past because they always have another angle to it which we end up missing if we are purely analytical so uh, again uh, you know as a storyteller i think i follow this way of uh, trying to visualize the story uh trying to see the story before i write it down and of course gods even rama krishna shiva i don't think they perform magic shows they are not entertainers they are gods <laughs> so uh you know so the divinity should not be reduced to a magic show uh i think if something supernatural is happening and it needs to happen very organically and uh, that's why uh, you know because uh, the kids these days they don't have a problem uh, accepting harry potter because there is a lot of uh, world building that happened which yes. means that the author has invested herself in building that world just because there is magic things don't get easier actually things get more complicated because of magic <laughs> so it's the same uh, uh, you know it's the same thing that uh, same approach that uh, we have to take so Uh, there was actually this reader who got really uh, you know not very agitated i would say i mean she's a friend so she came and asked me love so what is krishna according to you is he a man or is he a god because you know he gets wounded he bleeds and uh, you know he has his uh, you know human limitations but so do you think he is a man or he is a god and i said why should i decide it for you you should have uh, mm. you know my, my book is not there to decide where, you know whether krishna is human or god it's like how i would see him how he would choose to uh manifest to me i would uh, you know try to capture that part to the readers so it's uh, so i think uh, yes uh, scientific research uh it's nice to look at you know things in a rational way uh, especially if they are uh, like in covid time we got uh, i think our minds opened up to a lot of ancient wisdom be it ayurveda or be it uh, so some things which were just practiced and passed on from uh, through generations and it is making sense right uh, so we don't know what was the rationale behind uh, you know our ancestors when they started practicing those maybe they have seen certain pandemics uh you know they have just captured practices or they have just you know uh, learned through observation and uh, 
done it but you know they have that's the experiential way of uh, doing it right so uh, i think we have to keep an open mind and not limit our uh, you know lens while looking at these i think rightly said yeah sure yeah yeah just just adding uh, with your permission uh, chandra to what just sai ma'am just said you know krishna was the perfect amalgamation of nar and narayan and i think even in our lives at at you know at every moment sometimes we are the nar and sometimes we are a narayan to somebody so even during the covid times when we were adopting stray animals giving them food mm. for them we were the narayan and when you come inside the room and start fighting with your husband and children then you are the nar <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even the vanar at times <laughs> or rakshas <laughs> yeah especially those who started uh, selling also drugs in the to, bar, black market also coming back to you know the scientific research <laughs> yeah yeah then they are so know. you know we yeah. all are the nara narayana various thing and i think krishna was the perfect amalgamation of that so we also about you know the scientific research when children these days do believe in the avengers or anti gravity missiles and <laughs> weapons so all that is there in the war of mahabharata why is it is so different difficult sorry to believe in sanjay's divya drishti why we are doing exactly the same thing with our mobiles today Mm-hmm. It is a diversity. I'm talking to one person who's in the Middle East. One person, um, sorry, ma'am, sorry, ma'am. Uh, you are based out of Bangalore, <laughs> Bangalore, and I'm in Haridwar. Mm-hmm. So that is a diversity. So why, why do we we need to question whatever comes just because it is ancient? It's not supposed to mean that it is obsolete. Prachin hai, jarjar nahi. In Thank fact, you, uh, so many of our practices are highly scientific, but it's just that we've been conditioned, you know, to think that these are superstitions. I don't have to follow them. I don't have to practice them, and that's where we start questioning them. I think this is where, as you rightly mentioned, when people can love Harry Potter, why not mm. our kathas when there is so much to explore in them? Yeah, it is. It is. uh ma'am uh, mona ma'am since you were talking about nar and uh, narayan i there is a character in uh, daiva sutras your shikhandi uh who's also part male part female so this cure character he's occupying a space between a female and a male voice in the mythology hmm. so were there any challenges you faced in depict, depicting shikhandi's voice did you want it to be relatable to today's reader with the current themes that we address was that a concern i think chandra that's a that's a lovely question that's a fantastic question you know what i think this is the best time for us to write about gender fluid voices because they are more acceptable now when you write about ila shuddhaman you talk about Ad- ardhanarishwar or you talk yes. about shikhandi but why was shikhandi shikhandi and what was what was his relevance what what did his presence mean in the field where there were there were i mean you couldn't have a woman in that field true and bhishma could not have raised weapon against a woman so hmm. krishna said somebody a woman and yet not a woman so that is where shikhandi came in and who was shikhandi shikhandi was amba from the previous birth and what had bhishma done with her Hmm. how he had wronged her so you know we are talking about past life regression we are talking about future lives and we are talking about the strength of that character so the best thing was when i was uh, researching on shikhandi or ila or shuddhaman or ardhanarishwar these were not eyed with this brain they were accepted yes. openly never yes. but in i mean if you go back by 20 years and somebody were to portray a queer character whether in films or series people would be like ho oh, hmm what are Absolutely. you talking about how come you are uh, how come you are propagating this belief system but if you go back to the puranas you go back to the rigveda you go back to so many of our scriptures never i with this day and for young people to accept my voice i had to i had to bring forth 
the male voice the strong female voice and also the voice of the voice that was unheard until now the voice mm. of gender in between so it was not challenging in fact these were the characters that enjoyed the most uh huh when ila is 15 days female and shuddhaman is 15 days a male what happens everybody tells him it is perfectly fine you can come rule the kingdom for 15 days and on other days you could be go, you could, you can go back to the forest and be the wife to your husband we don't mind yes there's a lot of acceptance and tolerance there's no yes, judgment acceptance and tolerance this is the best time where people are coming out of the closet and accepting it why not bring forth those characters and tell the world out there that india is not a biased country we do not have these biased scriptures we do not adhere to those stereotypes we have these characters and these characters had a very valid uh, a, a very valid and a very strong presence in our stories so that is the reason i wanted to bring forth these three characters i really loved reading that chapter i mean there were so many chapters i loved i should i can't really list them all out uh, Thank i have you. a question yeah. here from monica so she says that uh, mytho fiction is a merger of puranic legends and fiction mm. how do you strike a balance between what is known and what you create or imagine must have happened uh Uh, let's say ma'am answer that first i've that's, been talking so okay. yeah no no that's fine uh, yeah uh, i think uh, it's a challenge uh, for uh, that uh, that is very customized to every author uh, i'm sure yeah. mona ji would be having her own uh, balance her own way of striking a balance i'll be having a, my own way of striking a balance you know that goes true for every author in this genre out there uh, mm. uh but i think uh, when uh, we all operate with this uh, format called a novel and a uh, novel has a certain uh, structure also i mean i know you know we do take liberties with the puranas and and this culture of uh, liberties right it is not something that we uh, our generation or our uh, previous generation invented it has been happening since the times of kalidasa you know that's the oldest uh, i guess i can go was the way he interpreted the story of shakuntala and dushyanta is much much different than uh, the way uh, it has been written in the mahabharata by vedavyasa and actually today if you look at uh, kalidasa's shakuntala and uh, vedavyasa's shakuntala uh, the shakuntala of vedavyasa comes as very strong and yes. uh, you know kind of confrontational and uh, who doesn't go back on her rights right uh, yeah. and Kalidasa had this challenge because when somebody writes a kavya the nayaka the hero has to be a deserving guy and uh, vedavyasa's dushyanta does not exhibit <laughs> that uh, you know deserving nature yes, so we yes. don't know we don't know what what was his problem uh, but it's like uh, you know kalidasa might have felt that uh, you know i need to work on dushyanta to make him uh, eligible as a for the nayaka of this kavya so he had to you know that's a prescriptive way you know if we have to give a modern uh, this one rather than cautionary he chose that prescriptive way of uh, uh, you know this were his qualities but he was cursed which is why uh, you know all this happened kind of a uh, uh, this one so uh, you know i think this kind of liberties are always taken and uh, uh, where i would say uh, artist an author should do is uh, you know draw a line to herself or to himself as to what should not be so uh, and i also think uh, it's the time we spend with our uh, source texts like i have spent a lot of time with the mahabharata somewhere i feel i enjoy a certain intimacy with uh, people uh, of mahabharata and i am kind of emboldened to take more liberties there uh, when you give me ramayana i have not spent enough time with ramayana so still i i'll not have that it's like uh, you know making friends right there are <laughs> you have your best friends with whom we take a lot of liberties but you are wishing them well they wish you well uh, you know same thing cannot be said about say colleagues or you know somebody you met just now you know you wouldn't take uh, i mean i think uh, that's one way of uh, doing it uh, just give me one more minute uh, i there's an allegory of uh, you know which i follow uh, mm-hmm. this story of bhagiratha bringing down ganga 
Bhagiratha had one name. His ancestors had to get, get Mukti. So Ganga has to come to where they were and bless them. You know, he had one name. Right? Mm -hmm. Ganga, uh, you know, she knows when a, when a uh, divine river comes from there to here, there is a lot to bless. There is a lot, you know, vast expanse of land. So, you know, he, she diverges, reconverges, uh, you know, goes. She doesn't exactly follow Bhagiratha like a good girl. She goes <laughs> out of the way. And, uh, you know, I think a uh, poet's imagination is like Ganga. As long as you reach the destination, it's, uh, you know, it's fine. That's my uh, <laughs> belief, right? As long as Ganga reaches where Bhagiratha wanted to reach, uh, I think any number of, uh, you know, deviations and reconvergences are <laughs> fine. What a lovely allegory you have shared there with us, Sai. I swear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> lovely. Uh, Mona, we have our next question Lending for you. This is uh, by, from Dr. Shweta Mathulal. So she wants to know if we can cheat mythology. What do you feel about bringing the characters from Puranas and adding uh, an episode of your own? Does it interfere with the belief system? Is it fair or unfair? Thank you for that question, Shweta. It's a wonderful question. Many people ask me this question. You know, when I, especially when I wrote the Deva Sutras, they asked me that how much of cheating goes into retelling, <laughs> rewriting? Depends. It's it's something which is very subjective. You cannot say it's like a right angle is only ninety degrees. So it's something like an objective fact. No. See, you cannot deviate from the mainstay of the story. You cannot. You can never do that. Neither should you. But. In case, like I said earlier, if there are like four verticals of writing, the character, his conflict, the object, the emotions and the dialogues, and you're using any one of those verticals to make your text more appealing, then what is the harm? For example, in case I'm writing about Yudhishthira, mm -hmm. now, rewriting Yudhishthira is not going to get me any readers because people can pick up the Mahabharata and read it and they will have more on Yudhishthira than I can ever tell them. Mm -hmm. I have to put Yudhishthira in a completely different light, delve into him as a human being. What does it, what does it feel like to be a co-husband with your brothers? How would a man feel? And how does it feel to be an epitome of truth and virtue all the time? After all, he was human. How difficult it is to be perfect all the time. So didn't he suffer from an imposter syndrome? How did he handle Draupadi's hatred towards him from time to time? How did he? So when I'm writing about those, those verticals of his emotions, of his experiences, then what is wrong? I'm bringing to you a face of him, which makes him more relatable because great human beings are deep, deeply, uh, you know, we are deeply faulty. <laughs> gray part of our our character makes us relatable so if you say somebody was an epitome of truth and virtue never told a lie was was the next best thing after the invention of fire and wheel young people are not going to relate to it you have to tell them about the human side of it so in case in case you know one day i was doing this workshop and it was basically a corporate workshop and somebody got up and he asked me it was a faculty training workshop in fact in our university and there was a very erudite uh, professor and she asked me that how do you explain the pandavas killing all the koravas it's not as if that all the boys were evil there was a youth too as well so I said, you know, there's a logic given by Krishna, which I was reading in a book. And it said that supposedly Parvati is a human body. Mm -hmm. And the five Pandavas are the five senses wedded to the human body. Now, mm -hmm. and who are the Kauravas? The hundred Kauravas are the hundred tendencies of the human mind, both good as well as bad. Now, if the five senses feel that they can gamble with the tendencies and win, it is wrong. What happens when you gamble and give in to all your tendencies, whether good or bad, you lose. Yes. Therefore, Krishna said that for you to lose, uh, sorry, for you to win, you have to exterminate all hundred tendencies. And that is why 
this happened so i'm giving a completely different completely different version of what people knew but if it convinces them then what's the harm i'm not retelling the story or i'm not deviating from the main story plot so i'm not cheating yes. but i'm giving them a point of view so when i write parvati son and i say that there was a war going on between a goddess and a mother where am i cheating i'm telling you the right thing she was a mother first she was a goddess to others but to vinayaka she was a mother and how can a mother accept another boy and you know like for all of us who are parents i mean somebody comes and says okay so that was not your boy this was your boy now will you accept <laughs> even at a very temporal level if you can't take it it's not happening so and when you talk about shakuni there was a human side to shakuni there was there there was a kunti sai ma'am would know in the past there was an episode there with her at that point he vowed to destroy her so if a woman if a man is spurred and belted and booted out of her kingdom how would he feel so if i'm retelling the whole story from a very human point of view from shakuni's point of view i'm not deviating from the main story line or from the character that was portrayed by ved vyasa but i'm yeah. adding another dimension to make it yes. more interesting for my uh, readers in so fact think, there are two instances in the mahabharata if you read unabridged even shakuni told duryodhana that uh, you know you now your jealousy is breaking its bounds uh, yes. you know i think uh, you know there you might have to accept that your cousins are superior to you and uh, you know instead be friends with them you know it's not like right. shakuni was all evil and uh, you know as a, it's not like he was driving I mean, he was hmm. naturally more uh, you know attached to his nephew that uh, you know that is human as uh, mona ji said and he was loyal to his nephew it's you know it's not like uh, and he's not that evil devious uh, you know the way i think some tv serials portray with all those <laughs> yeah yeah he was, a, he was yeah. a very intelligent erudite man yeah yeah so i think to you know just summarize uh, shweta's question I, i think it's fair as long as you're not suddenly creating shakuni son or a daughter you're not bringing a character which is not there but as long as you're conveying the perspectives in a, probably even in a different manner but it is not straying from the truth what happened then i think it is fair it would not really be cheating yes no but uh, as far as a novel goes i think even creating new characters is fine uh, you know oh, really? as long as they okay. don't yeah 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 i mean we do it all the time at least i do it all the time the uh, you know ancient poets they all did it because each mm -hmm. character uh, you know they represent a certain voice and uh, new characters actually represent the author if i may say and uh, the questions mm -hmm. that yes. author has very well uh, so very well yes said. yes so i don't think given uh, you know that is actually wrong as long as uh, you know the authors shouldn't get into that uh, uh, you know uh, this uh, you know place where they say this is true right yeah you know we should be so honest think, enough to uh, say this is my creation i mean abhaya did not exist uh, yes we don't know you know i mm -hmm. just imagined her to be one of this 16000 and uh, you separate your voice from abhaya's voice exactly we'll have to <laughs> yes i think that's i have another interesting question here from samya so she says that she stays away from myth mythological retellings because they lack layers and depth of the original text how can an author retell a story without losing the spiritual layers of the original story uh here let me appreciate the depth uh, the in depth questions that your audience is putting in uh, chandra <laughs> i am uh, you know really really impressed with yeah. the kind of questions very different thank you sir <laughs> we have a wonderful yeah. team i mean when yes. we have a beautiful family of writers here Sure. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll uh, love to listen to what Monaji would say for this and uh, add my points. Okay. Okay. So, Mia. So here, when you can say how how can an author retell a story without losing the spiritual layers of original story? But why do we need to lose the spiritual layer of original story? We don't need to lose. We do not need to minus anything. In fact, we can add. Mm -hmm. Don't minus anything from it. Add, add a human dimension to it. As I was just talking about oh, Shakuni, 
and ma'am explained it so beautifully okay. and uh, then we spoke about yudhishthir if you are adding that human dimension to their character which makes them relatable and more reliable which is also the title of our talk today then what's the harm but we are not taking away we are not telling yes. them that dropadi didn't exist or we are not telling them what was going on in her mind when you know she she became the wife of the five pandava brothers we are not saying uh, that uh, shakuni was not the gandhar ratn or that he was not an erudite man he was a very wise man but he was spiteful and that also mm. came with the past so that you know all those layers are there so we are just adding to make it more appealing we are not taking away anything from that so in case we say if we if i am talking to a young person and telling them about sanjay's divya drishti and showing him a mobile which is like five dimensional panorama in our pockets all the time and telling them to the, see this is doing exactly the same thing and he's convinced then what's the harm if you are talking about anti gravity weapons and showing them um, a series on mahabharata and he is convinced then what is the harm because he is believing that when it comes from a movie in the west but when it happens in the mahabharata suddenly it becomes obsolete for them <laughs> true so true so we add to make it appealing we don't take away anything from that and how dare can we take away because india it has a such a rich repository of legends tales epics that there are yes. and that they are what make up the socio political economic uh, backcloth of our society how can we take away anything from that very well said uh sai uh, i know you wanted to answer this question but i have another one which is similar yeah. lines so if you could address this as well So uh Natasha wants to know how does one deal with my to Oh uh, I uh, did we lose Chandra Yes okay I think, I think I'll uh, yeah yeah I'll answer the question as so uh, how does one deal with the mytho fiction uh, especially when with the kind of cancel culture prevalent uh I think Natasha uh i say i would consider myself uh, you know moderately traditional uh, and uh, i think there will be 1000 people who feel i am not traditional enough and i would consider myself uh, you know very much modern uh, when it comes to a lot of things and there would be another 1000 people who uh, would uh, you know consider me so i think there are always people who want to cancel you out uh, you know how much ever uh, you know effort uh you put in so here it's very important uh, for us to be true to ourselves firstly uh not exactly play to the market because that market is uh, you know well we have to respect the market we have to respect the readers we have to respect their time and uh, you know their uh, curiosity about knowing stuff everything that we have to respect but we shouldn't uh you know uh, try and play to the gallery is what i want to say once you start playing to the gallery it's like the market leads you and you need you don't you stop leading it and uh, there we fail the artist in us artist is always there to show a new aspect and we have to do a lot of tapasya within ourselves to come for that come to that yeah. new aspect and then uh, you know work to show it to the world so uh, i mean i would say don't be afraid of cancel culture but definitely be afraid of the limiting uh, part of your brain that is mm. what uh, you mm. know something that uh, mona ji had said uh, you know uh, maybe this this is outdated or this does this cannot be true or the you know it has to be scientifically valid or you know those limiting factors is something which we should take away but uh, we shouldn't be afraid of uh, those cancel culture guys i mean they'll go they'll come they'll go we have uh, we, you know we our commitment is to create art absolutely absolutely simon uh, you know we uh, have been uh, you know this is this new culture of uh, kind of being too politically correct you know it is going on uh, these days and it kind of limits the Uh, stories that we can tell and the things that we want to write about and i absolutely agree with you on that i apologize uh, chandra has lost the connection and i will be joining sure. in now okay. and i will be taking uh, for the questions mona do you want to say something about this cancel culture 
Well, as uh, you know, I mean, I really don't have anything to add because Sai Ma'am has she summed it so beautifully and so extensively that this culture will always be there. You know, no matter where we are coming from, it was there centuries ago. It will prevail centuries later as well. So the flash and the pan will always be there, but the pan needs to remain. True. So the pan will. Let the flashes come and go. It happens because, uh, you know, uh, it is convenient for a certain section of society to believe in certain things. It is just convenient. So when I, you know, honestly, when I was writing Lost and Found in Banaras, which was based on the child widows of Banaras, and I visited Banaras, I saw so many um, traditions that were prevalent over there, which were convenient to a certain section of society. At one point, these women are ostracized from society, and yet they need to stave off the call of flesh at all times. That is convenient. Mm -hmm. Ostracizing is also convenient. So either way, the women stood to lose, and the like. I always use this terminology: the male proponents of law and religion stood to gain in both ways. Right. Right. So there will be things that are convenient for a particular section for a particular period of time. But things change, people change, people change, times change, and the the mindsets change. So I, so I don't think so. We need to add, uh, you know, any any mental volume to the cancel culture. Exactly. Okay. Agree. Absolutely agree. All right. Uh, this is one question that even I wanted to ask. Uh, Mithila is asking, there are many versions culturally, regionally of every ancient scripture. While deciding on any episode or event, how difficult is it to select which version you want to follow and carry on? This is something that I wanted to know. Uh, Sai, can you please uh, shed some light on your process? Uh, so yes, I was uh, as I was talking about uh, Abhaya. I uh, you know I myself uh, came across uh, three variations of uh, you know one episode, mm. and I think uh, variation itself occurs because there was some poet or some rishi who saw a new side to it, and uh, you know that got uh, incorporated into a certain uh, sampradaya or certain uh, legacy of knowledge right and uh, that would uh, have uh, you know just uh, gotten the mileage because of the followership and how it uh, really resonates with the people and how it remains relevant uh, so i don't think uh, you know we have to sit and decide what is right and what is wrong uh, you know that is not uh, you know our uh, this our uh, aim should be to learn right and take what is relevant to us and how to how do we become a better uh, version of ourselves and i say say this from the point of view of all the readers like uh, i mean mona ji was giving this beautiful example of yudhishthira right so yeah. i i do come across some people who say is it right to call yudhishthira dharma raja it's like uh, you know why are we sitting to judge yudhishthira there <laughs> I mean, uh, a person of his knowledge, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I think uh, other than Bhishma and Vidura and maybe uh, the Rishis, I don't think there is any other person that knowledgeable of, uh, you know, of Dharma as uh, Yudhishthira was. And, yes. and somebody yes. so knowledgeable could drop to that level and bounce back. So that's the, you know, that's the lesson uh, to be, uh, you very know, very to be taken. Yeah. So, you know, you, uh, you face that all is lost moment, you face your yeah. own weaknesses and you uh, gather mm -hmm. your family and, uh, you know, put your family together and bounce back from that situation. So that's a beautiful uh, lesson to be uh, learned from the life of Yudhishthira rather than yeah. we sitting and judging whether he's Dharma Raja or not. We don't have to. He doesn't care. That's, that's so true. That's so true, Sai. Right. Yeah. Who are we to judge all of these people? And and why are we not focusing on the right kind of things that you know can impact our lives and can change our lives? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mona, what do you wanted to say? Well, there was, I will, uh, because ma'am has already said it and she does it so brilliantly that generally I don't have much to add once she's spoken. So next time I'm asking yeah, the question. It's mutual. <laughs> it's, it's mutual, really. I mean, it's no, a joy to discover you, Mona, said, 
very brilliantly put but i'll give you i'll give you an example so i was writing about the story of tarakshi ma'am would know she was the bird who witnessed the battle of mahabharata where the elephant bell falls on her and there are four birds four draw fledglings and now these fledglings are on the vindhyas and rishi jamini goes to the birds to seek some answers the answers to the vexed questions that he has about life about ideology about philosophy about the mahabharata and also about krishna now when i was doing the research these four birds that he meets over there these birds have different names in different versions now i do not saint jamini is not my facebook friend right no krishna is not with me on instagram now who do i go to and find out what is the right name of the birds so one scripture wrote to bhu found another set of scriptures went through them now i have found three names which were repeating themselves constantly but for one so i found supatra sumukha vibhuda but the one which is pingashka that name was again a huge dichotomy somewhere it said pingska some said pingashka now i wanted to get the name right so how do i get this right i spoke to many people and everybody you know the way people speak that is a way they they know it that the way they pronounce it now how to get that name right and it's a beautiful story i needed to get the name right so i went down to a sanskrit dictionary and sought the meaning of the word pingashka now the word means the one that has yellow eyes and birds have yellow eyes birds have yellow eyes and that that really? is what convinced me that this has to be the right name because we will find these dichotomies when you will go through various scriptures which are and you know because these are shrutis and smritis they were bound to be so many dichotomies now how to get it right so do some research do do some scientific research find out the name of uh, you know the meanings of those names because um uh, the puranas the puranas had lots of iconography there every name you know i can, if you if you read or any epic kaliya nag krishna their names suggested their character um hmm. so okay. was an iconograph graphic name and it had to represent something so what does pingashka mean it means the yellow eyed one and said bingo that's the name mm-hmm. of the bird so i went mm-hmm. with that but yes certainly um sometimes there could be mistakes but we try our level best not to tide over them in fact not to make them tide over them right absolutely yeah it is a lot of research actually you know goes behind the stories uh, that we are reading the retellings that we are reading a lot of research definitely <laughs> certainly i yeah, lost the world because in my family when i am researching and the phone is off and everything and somebody comes and asks my mother in law where is mona and she says the kai kai cop bhavan mein baithi hai nobody can <laughs> so please <laughs> Bhavan, please don't disturb. <laughs> All right. Ah, uh, we have already overshot our time for the session, and I will just hold you guys for one more question, which is very, very interesting. Ah, uh, Ranjini asks: Episodes in the epics like Sita's Agni Pariksha and Draupadi's Chir Haran. How do you portray these incidents with relevance to the new generation, with your point of view? so you know why i'm i'm asking this question is because you know there are a lot of versions out there a lot of perspectives out there some people you know say that they were feminists some people say they were you know oppressed so you know how do you deal with these kind of episodes they are very very triggering for you know readers as yes, well yes uh, yes yes hi ma'am please so firstly oh, you uh, want to go first this time sorry <laughs> Mona wanted Sorry. to go for his no, first no, no, time. Oh, please, 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 please. No, 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 no. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I, I was um, waiting for. Yes, for her. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so sure. Or it is a wisdom. Yes. No. Yes. Sure. So, firstly, I, uh, you know, there is one. Uh, uh, the, you know, these two incidents uh, happen from different angles. uh whereas uh, sita's agni pravesha i don't call it pariksha nobody uh, you know nobody asked her to enter the fire and you know say enter the fire and show your purity that's not the way it is done rama never asked her to do that uh it was a voluntary thing 
whereas okay. draupadi's chirharan was forced it was an atrocity it was a uh, you know square uh, sit, you know thinking peg sitting in the square this it's defined as an atrocity uh, right so when you comes come to draupadi's chirharan uh, it is uh, you know vidura himself gives a very beautiful uh, uh, you know uh, what you call uh, not explanation but uh, he says who is responsible he tells dhritarashtra in a gathering in a gathering when something wrong happens the head of the that gathering that is you here you own 50% of the pap occurring out of this atrocity not dushasana and 25% of the pap is owned by rest of all of us who did not do anything who knew that wrong was happening and did not do anything and only only 25% of the pap goes to the actual perpetrator because the perpetrator does this thing because Uh, does something wrong because there is a, a whole uh, ecosystem clandestinely supporting him so he throws that uh, you know the whole uh, responsibility as on to dhritarashtra saying you were the one guy who had the power to stop the game you did not do it right right right, right. you were the one guy so i think uh, you know the that draupadi shiraharan is wrong is something that you know that was decided then and there it didn't wait right. for i mean you know they didn't uh, have to wait till 21st century to you know decide right. that it is wrong and uh, then it comes to sita's agni pravesha uh, i know it's a problematic chapter in the mahabharata yes. it's not yes. uh, you know it's not something that we can easily but there are certain things uh, with, from rama's speech that we should uh, think about and then make our own and as as i said i don't enjoy that intimacy with ramayana that i enjoy with mahabharata but two things uh, really uh, made me uh, you know stop and think is uh, rama starts that conversation uh, addressing sita as bhadra right huh? right and uh, bhadra means uh, pure one of the meanings of bhadra is pure fortunate right. auspicious so if he is going to put that allegation on her what is the point of calling her bhadra so i mean that's yeah. so right. there is something right. to pause and think and yeah. there is a there is a, a simile a metaphor he makes saying uh, you know whatever you know you have been uh, there for so long so you are as uh i mean i think uh, english doesn't give good words here say he says you are as useless to me as light is to a blind person uh-huh. right right uh-huh. so here also it's sita is compared to a light and ram and uh, the person who doubts her purity is compared to a blind person blind person right and right. it is rama himself saying it Uh, uh, right and finally uh, what yeah. he says is uh, you are free to choose your partner i won't you know force you to be with me but maybe i should i cannot accept you back uh, you know after the whole thing happened you are free to choose uh, you can choose lakshmana bharata shatrughna uh, you know or you can choose vibhishana you can choose sugriva uh, and the, that's you know that, that's when she says enough is enough you know what you are speaking mm-hmm. is not what rama speaks uh, uh, right? right there's something heavily wrong with uh, uh, the way but anyways because you know you think that i am i don't fit you let me end my life or let me you know this body if it is not fit for my husband it is fit for agni because you know he is the one who's the consumer he is the one who conveys everything to the gods above so and that's when uh, you know agni comes and uh, testifies and not just agni all the gods and right. in mahabharata when the Ram, when rama uh, when ramopakhyana is uh, uh, you know is recollected uh, this agni pariksha is not there the moment rama utters uh, you know whatever uh, things that he uttered all gods come and say what the hell is wrong with you rama uh, okay okay you know why are you okay. you know why you are speaking like a very fallen man you are not speaking like the avatar you feel you know you are speaking like a really lowly person how he would speak right 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 so i think we had the perspectives right there uh, mm-hmm. you know 
if only we read enough we have the right perspective right there it doesn't need a 21st century feminist to call out those uh, yeah so, right right yeah mona uh, would you want sorry to for the long answer <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, yeah it's uh, yeah, yeah, perfectly yeah. fine they are like sorry it is a wisdom ma'am now if you see the valmiki ramayana does not mention chaya sita there is another version also yes yes, yes right yes. and only tulsidas ramayan does now there was a chaya sita they say that originally the real sita was in agni's protection all throughout because it was prophesized that she will be abducted by ravana so chaya sita took her place but when sita went back to her husband then what happened to chaya sita though there is another version but you have to add relevance validity to that particular version so over here in one story it the in my book this is story number 6 called the chaya sita it says if if i have your permission monica just to read couple of lines thank you so chaya sita was a lady in practice austerities in the in pushkar please with her penance shiva transformed her into swarg lakshmi shiva appeared and enlightened her you were vedvati a woman ravana tried to molest in a previous birth and you caused ravana and you sorry you cursed ravana that you will be the cause of his destruction in this life you will take three births and three yugas vedvati in satya yuga chaya sita in treta yuga and draupadi in dwapar yuga you will be known as trihayani the one who appears in three ages this made chaya sita eternal and a protector of feminine powers across all yugas oh. but then valmiki ramayan does not mention <laughs> this at all so whichever version you read in case it convinces you because see what is our role our role is not to appease you with any hogwash any story our role is to convince you so when we convince you about trihayani and her role in the three yugas the reader takes to us it takes to the story that is being told so there are various versions both of the mahabharata as well as the ramayana but the one that convinces you the most convinces us the most as a writer as well that's so that's true actually i think how yeah. are we going to convince our reader ha huh, absolutely absolutely i think one of the things that i found that i have been reading in a lot of mythological stories right now and i found that you know uh, the role of the writer is to present you with a new perspective and you have to take it with a grain of salt and understand and you know go with this as assumption that it could have happened this way you know hmm. okay this is something that i know this is something that our legends to told us but if i'm reading this book maybe it could have happened this way because right at this point we are nobody to say that this is true and this is false this is how it happened this is how it not happened so i think that's one thing that we have to do as readers that you know just allow for that possibility that it could have happened this way you know and Most it's a continuous the... journey it's yes, a continue yes. it doesn't stop there you know yes <laughs> yes <laughs> and what is okay. what is basically a, a, you know what is a legend or a fable uh, sorry what is uh, what is a reality now could be a legend or a fable after many centuries for example yes. what if disneyland goes under water and centuries later it is discovered so people will start believing in the existence of fairies and ghouls <laughs> and the kind of world disneyland portrays or look at harry potter now people they, down the century people will start believing that yes this particular platform existed because it has been created right. to add volume to that work right so right so history history and fables do come together at one particular point like for example if i were to say that when malik mohammad jaisi wrote padmavat at that moment he said it is an allegorical tale and it was also re, you know told as a bedtime story to children in persia as well but today it is almost sacrilege to believe that it is an uh, allegorical thing yes yes they yes. said the lakla suta khilji he existed so padmavati has to exist mm -hmm. so even if there's a partial evidence of existence of a particular uh, there's a physical evidence of exist that still exists then people start believing that 
whatever is supposed to come across as a fable or comes across as a folk tale or comes across as mythology it takes no time to turn into history and people sure. start believing in it true it's true. a very thin line very very thin line absolutely <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, we have we are well past our one hour session, and there have there have been a lot of comments and compliments for both of you, uh, Sai Ma'am, Muna. Like amazing, amazing engagement on our session today, and I thank, thank you. you so much for coming here and for talking to us and giving us so many stories. This was like you know a storytelling session for me. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you, thank so, you so much and uh, thanks to all the audience for those very pertinent very innovative questions yes uh, yes that, it's, that it's actually wonderful. brings me to and, this uh, i want to know the names the, the the questions that you found very very interesting so that we can gift your book to those uh, questions uh, mona uh, would you want to highlight uh, to people uh, who were asked like the best questions uh, there was a dr lal Yes, Shweta Matralal. Yes, yes. Cheat yes. mythology. Yes. <laughs> yes, mythology. So, uh, I uh, to me her question and Natasha. Natasha, right? All right. And All Natasha, right. Great. These two. Um, and then there was one more person. I'm so sorry. I'm not getting the name right. Uh, if you can just remember the question, what it was, I can go back and search for them. Uh, the lady had asked me about you know the scientific research Ranjini. relevance that's Ranjini. Yes. Ranjini. Yes. Yes. yes yes those were my Ranjini. three stars Ranjini, natasha and shweta congratulations <laughs> uh saiman would you want to highlight the the questions that you found very very interesting yeah i loved the uh... I think Mithila uh, asked about Mithila. Uh, you know uh, different uh, versions and how to... versions. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, I personally questions. loved all the questions by the yes. three selected by Mona Ji. <coughs> Mithila Very difficult and, uh, to basically pinpoint, but uh, uh, <laughs> I guess let's divide all those lovely questions amongst ourselves, Sai Ma'am. Exactly, so that's really exactly. I know. <laughs> and you... <laughs> I know. So, I, I hope we can record these questions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Very, very, can, um, very engaging, uh, very compelling yeah. questions. Yes. 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 The session so is how many can I? Uh, how many can I select? You can select three. Three. Okay. And uh, Kushbu, yeah. uh, the first question that uh, she right. asked about uh, uh, right. Kushbu, yes. Mithila, Kushbu. Uh, and if I can uh, remember. Uh, was there some other question about uh, uh there was this uh, question by Soumya about uh, you know she stays away from mythological retellings and you know yes uh, yes yes way. yeah yes yes Soumya yeah, yeah? Mm -hmm. okay <laughs> all right so, so we have six questions six people asking questions three for ma'am and three for me and yet <laughs> yes. all of them were brilliant now that when she's talking about um uh, you know Soumya and the others now I'm recollecting oh yeah that was also yeah, very yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry we are not recollecting all the questions but you know the first three exactly. ones that struck us we are um, and uh, uh, otherwise very very engaging audience very very engaging thank yes, you yes for listening all right uh, so, so for saima mithila mithila uh, mithila somya and khushbu congratulations you guys you get a copy of rukmini Yay. <laughs> <laughs> all right and I'm thank you mind, ma saima <laughs> learning experience just listening to you just listening to you was such a great learning experience. I wonder what will happen when I come face to face with you. In oh some my God. Uh, I think I, the feeling is totally mutual. I discovered <laughs> so many stories and uh, it's a joy to see a woman author so involved with uh, the scriptures. And uh, I'm going to pick up your books uh, to Monaji. Thank you. Thank uh, you. So hoping I'm to meet to you in it. person sometime. Yes, surely. Thank you so but, much. <laughs> Thank you, Muna. Thank you, Simon. Thank you so much. Thank this you. was Thank amazing you. and eye-opening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Bye. We had a wonderful time with you. And thank you, Penmensi and Kajal Kapoor, as I call her my Kapoorsa. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye.